Evening. I'm Martin B. Matt, Director of the Global Policy Research Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you this evening to our Global, Poli to our global Connections Lecture Series. This is the third in the series. The first was given last March by Dr. Siegfried Hecker on nuclear nonproliferation, and the second was given last October by Ambassador Louise Oliver, who was the first uh, uh, head of the U.S. delegation back to UNESCO after several years of hiatus. This lecture series provides faculty, staff, students, and local community members with the opportunity to meet and exchange ideas with world-renowned individuals who influence policymakers on a global level. Bringing these thought leaders to campus provides them with an opportunity to learn more about Purdue its world-class researchers, its student leaders, its innovation, innovative projects and initiatives in a variety of disciplines. Our speaker tonight needs no introduction to Purdue, as you can tell by all his friends in the audience. And his uh, talk is going to be the Arab Awakening one year on. And there's no person that I can think of that is more qualified to speak on this subject from personal experience than Ambassador Mawasher. Ambassador Marwan Moasher is Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment, where he oversees the endowment's research on the Middle East and its Washington, D.C. and Beirut offices. He served as Jordan's Foreign Minister from 2002 to 2004 and Deputy Prime Minister from 2004 to 2005. His career has spanned the areas of diplomacy, development, civil society, and communications. In 1995, Marwan opened Jordan's first embassy in Israel, and in 1996 became Minister of Education and Jordan's sp uh, global spokesman uh, for the uh, Jordan-Israeli Peace Accord. From 1997 to 2002, he served in Washington again as ambassador negotiating the first free trade agreement between the United States and an Arab nations. Marwan is author of the book, The Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation, published by Yale University Press in 2008. He received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees from Purdue University in electrical engineering. Now that should be a lesson to all you engineers in the audience that there are many new career opportunities open to you. He also received an honorary degree from Purdue in 1999. It's quite rare when a person who's received a PhD also receives an honorary PhD at a later time. Marwan serves as a member of the Global Policy Research Institute's External Advisory Council, so we have the benefit of his wisdom and advice. Ambassador Mawasher is a global boiler maker. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Marwan Mawasher. Dr. Bamant, um, it's always a pleasure to be back at Purdue. This has been a, a truly nostalgic and uh, beautiful couple of days. Uh, it would have been perfect if we won yesterday, but uh, <laughs> better luck next time, uh, next year, I guess. Uh, the subject of my topic is uh, what I call the Arab awakening. Uh, I uh, purposely uh, m uh, move away from calling it an Arab Spring yet, because even though I think that this is a process that is long overdue in a region that has not known movement on governance to the exclusion probably of all other regions of the world in the last 30 or 40 years. So while the process uh, uh, had been bound to happen for a long time, uh, I still think that we're going to go through many seasons multiple times over before we arrive at stable and hopefully uh, pluralistic societies in the Middle East. In a region that has not known politi political party cultures 
or uh, c strong civil society organizations, uh, the romantic notion that somehow the end of autocr autocrats in the region will usher in uh, automatically uh, democratic uh, and pluralistic systems of governance, I think has already uh, been shattered. And uh, we can uh, all uh, sort of work hard uh, uh, and be more realistic about uh, how long the process uh, will take. I firmly believe that this is a process that will take decades to unfold rather than months or years. And if one is to measure it uh, by months or even years, uh, all of us will get a lot of heartburns watching the news every morning. Uh, and so I caution, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, stark uh, some of the developments can be, uh, I caution people not to draw the conclusion that this is uh, somehow uh, is a process that should not have happened. Uh, nothing is further from the truth. I also want to say that uh, after one year, we already have seen three leaders uh, being toppled, a fourth on his way out in Yemen in a couple of days. Yemen will have uh, presidential elections, and a fifth which in all probability will be out this year uh, in Syria. And so it is very difficult to look at this and uh, uh, talk about it as if it is a reversible process. It is certainly widespread in the Middle East, certainly in my view irreversible, but also a bumpy process uh, that will not move linearly all the time and that will not move smoothly before we reach pluralistic societies. I divide the Arab world today into two categories, not only because I uh, like things to be simple, uh, but also to drive the point home. And these two categories are countries that have some time on their hand and countries whose time is up. I say this because for those countries who have still time on their hand, who, who don't have time on their hands, countries that have already undergone transitions, such as Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, uh, uh, Syria uh, soon, I hope, uh, these countries have basically given up the pace of reform to the street. These are countries that have argued uh, for a long time that they have an infinite time on their hands and therefore they don't need to move quickly on reform uh, until because the, the street is not has not moved in the Arab world for a long time. Well, no one can say this anymore, hopefully, after the events that started in January of 2011. And as such, the street is great at starting change, but is never good at institutionalizing it. And therefore, for those countries that have not undergone transition so far, countries with time on their hands, either because they have more legitimate systems or sometimes because they have more money, uh, and by these countries I mean uh, mostly the monarchies of the Arab world, the poor monarchies in Egypt and in Morocco and Jordan, and the rich monarchies in the Gulf, uh, most of these countries, probably with the exception of Bahrain, still have some time on their hands. And they can use this time in one of two ways. They can either say to themselves, let us, use, let us use this time wisely to put in place a reform process from above that ensures smooth transitions to democracy, that ensures that you don't introduce shocks to the system, and can basically move to pluralistic societies through power sharing, or they can read the time that they have uh, into giving them a false sense of security that they don't need to do much uh, because they have not witnessed the kind of protests that other countries have. This is what worries me most, is whether the countries that still have time are going to be wise about starting a reform process from above or not. And while I fully understand that reform processes started by governments uh, don't have many uh, examples in history, uh, they still offer to me the best chance of 
uh, as I said, uh, a less bumpy road to democracy and pluralism than otherwise. And what do I mean when I say a serious reform process? Uh, a serious reform process, in my opinion, is one that leads to power sharing. The main problem in the Arab world is that the executive has just been too dominant. And the legislative and judicial branches of government have been either rubber stamps or weak uh, or not able to perform their function of developing a system of checks and balances that can check abuses by the exec exec executive. As such, uh, we have seen, because the executive has been very powerful in the Arab world and very dominant, we have seen uh, uh, abuses of power, corruption, uh, business elites, uh, cronies of the system benefiting uh, even from economic liberalization scheme to the exclusion uh, of many. Uh, this leads me to talk about uh, the issue that is on everybody's mind today, which is that of political Islam. Uh, there's a lot of concern, both in this country and uh, in the region, about the uh, uh, sort of uh, surge of political Islamist parties and what that might do to uh, uh, pluralism, to personal and minority rights, etc., in the region. And uh, what I would like to say is that political Islam, in my view, is neither the despot uh, or the democrat uh, in the Arab world. Uh, it is time to demystify, in my view, uh, political Islam. Why? Because of several reasons. One, political Islam is not monolithic, as many would uh, think, uh, especially in this country. Whereas when you talk about political Islam in this country, many people associate it, it with fringe groups such as Al-Qaeda or with a radical group that use violence such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Most of the political, of political Islamist forces, the overwhelming majority, which belongs either to the Muslim Brotherhood or its offshoots in different Arab countries, have been peaceful for the last 50 years. So in that sense, we're not dealing with, uh, 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 with a violent group. We might not be uh, very uh, uh, comfortable with their political views, but the fact remains that those who are gaining, uh, those who have uh, won the elections, whether in Egypt, Tunisia, or Morocco, where recent elections have taken place, all of these parties have committed to pursuit of their objectives through peaceful means. That's the first distinction that I would like to make. The second one is that political Islam has been strengthened by Arab regimes themselves because when they kept closed political systems for a long time and when the only alternative to the political establishment were the religious opposition because Arab regimes could not close down the mosques, all of the protest vote uh, naturally went to the Islamists. If people were not satisfied with their system of governance, the only other alternative they could resort to were the Islamists. And therefore, in my view, in the last 40 or 50 years, the Islamists have been strengthened through their being kept artificially outside the system. They could use slogans that were merely slogans that were not put to the test uh, uh, and as such could pontificate to the electorate without really having to prove anything. Today, Islam is the solution is a great slogan, but it doesn't create jobs, which is what will really determine in the end whether uh, any political party is going to be successful in the emerging Arab world uh, or not. The problem with political Islam, uh, as most secular uh, forces would tell you, is that its commitment to pluralism is questionable. Whether political Islam is going to use 
democracy to come to power and then deny, it, deny the right of organization to others is a question on everybody's mind. Whether political Islam is going to impose its religious or cultural views on the rest of society is another uh, uh, question that people pose. And I think these are uh, totally justifiable questions, uh, but I also uh, uh, maintain that the secular forces that have ruled the Arab world for the last 50 years were equally not committed to pluralism. <clears throat> there has been no secular force in the Arab world that has come to power, whether it was the Ba'athists in Syria and Iraq, whether it was the Nasserists in Egypt, whether it was the nationalists in North Africa, or whether it was the monarchies. Not a single Arab system truly was committed to uh, pluralism at all times. And therefore, it is a question to be asked, not just of the Islamists from now on, in my view, but of everybody. And it should be a fight, not of Islamists versus the secularists, but of everybody, Islamists and secularists alike, for pluralism instead of against each other. And whether the Arab world is going to be able to put in place a set of rules that would ensure a peaceful rotation of power, that would ensure personal, the protection of personal and minority rights, and that would also ensure peaceful means, whether the Arab world is going to be able to do that successfully or not is still an open question mark. Some people are <clears throat> already doing better than others, I would say that the best chance for success so far rests with Tunisia, uh, because Tunisia so far has had all the elements for success. It has a neutral army, which did not interfere in the elections. It has a thriving middle class uh, with rights that have been acquired uh, uh, that are uh, revered by all. It has a moderate Islamist party that has committed itself to a coalition, a coalition government and to the principle of pluralism at all times. And therefore, they're moving very well along the road to, uh, 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 I think, a pluralistic system. Uh, others, like Egypt, are struggling and will continue to struggle for a while. Egypt, however, is a 5,000 at least year old civilization. And I don't think that in the end, uh, the Egyptians uh, will fail to produce a pluralistic society. Uh, a lot of people are worried about uh, the example of Iran being repeated. I uh, do not believe that we will witness another theocracy in the Middle East. I think if Iran did anything that is positive in our region, it is to show us all what not to do in, in way of governance. The, the, the Iranian uh, uh, model of governance has simply failed. It has failed because uh, it sold itself to people as a, a, a system that is on the side of the oppressed, while its uh, support for the Syrian regime in Damascus has shown everybody that they are not really on the side of the oppressed. It has... Uh, 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 argued that violence is the way to go to change systems. Violence has not worked in the Middle East, and Egyptians and others were able to show that in just 18 days, they were able to change their government and their leader uh, peacefully. Um, and so, uh, in my view, uh, uh, we will not see another Iran. And I think that the Islamists today, in the elections that we have seen, have seen a peak of their support. I do not uh, believe that in uh, 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 consequent elections, Islamists will get the same kind of support, and I'll tell you why. Uh, many reasons. I watched, uh, monitored the elections as part of an international team in Tunisia last October. And last October in Tunisia, 110 parties contested the elections. One Islamist party and 109 secular ones. Naturally, the vote was divided among them all, and the 20% that the Islamists commanded in terms of popular support were translated into 41% of the Tunisian parliament. Well, 
How many of the 110 parties got seats in the Tunisian parliament? Seven. Uh, what that means is that in the next elections, which will take place in a year and a half, guess what? There won't be 110 parties contesting the elections. There might be 15 or 20 parties. And we're already witnessing a consolidation of uh, such parties. This is not unlike what took place, for example, in Spain and Portugal in the 70s, when also a large number of political parties were formed at the beginning you know, as people were thirsty for democracy and, and freedom, uh, but then, uh, 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 then become more realistic about how to go about organizing themselves and making their voices uh, heard. The second uh, reason, uh, I believe, is that the success, as I said before, or failure of any force uh, or combination of forces that will rule in the Arab world from now on is going to be their ability to create jobs and their ability to uh, 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 put together a successful economic model. You look at a place like Egypt, today Egypt is sinking economically. Uh, it's, a, it's in very, very dire straits. The reserves in Egypt have gone down from $36 billion before the, before the uh, uprisings to $10 billion today. So they've lost already most of their reserves, and it's still going down. And the ability of uh, parties to uh, 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 do well uh, in governing is going to be uh, very closely tied to whether they can find solutions to these economic problems. So whether it is the Islamists or any other force, they are not going to be able to live with slogans alone if they're not able to translate these slogans into solid programs uh, uh, or otherwise face uh, uh, being ousted uh, in the next elections. A word about uh, education. Uh, this is, a, uh, this is a, a field that I've become very passionate about because I believe that no pluralistic modes of behavior can emerge and can be, uh, 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 can lead to uh, relatively uh, uh, quick transitions to democracy if proper attention is not given to educational systems in the Arab world. And uh, education is talked about a lot uh, in our region, but in, I think, uh, in an incomplete sense because most of the money that has been spent on education in the region, and the Arab world spent a lot of money on education, about an average of 5% of GDP is being spent on education. Most of that money has gone towards the quantity of education, putting people to schools, uh, building uh, uh, schools, uh, uh, worrying about the technical aspects, uh, engineering and ma uh, physics and math scores, for example, in international tests, uh, and even uh, introducing computers to schools. All of these are very, very important, but hardly sufficient if the content of the educational system does not teach people how to think critically, how to question uh, truths that are given to them as absolute, uh, how to do research, how to communicate, how to have the skills that are necessary in today's world. And equally importantly, how to learn to be tolerant of others, to accept other points of views, to understand that uh, there is no simple truth to uh, uh, any issue in life, etc. And whereas these are things that uh, you might uh, see as basic uh, uh, in this country, they are by no means basic in a region that is used to rote learning, to memorization, to people uh, being uh, fed information, to people being told uh, uh, what to think rather than how to think, etc. And unless proper attention is given to education, which takes decades, uh, 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 we, the Arab world is going to face uh, uh, great difficulty in making these transitions to pluralistic systems. Any talk uh, about uh, the Arab world uh, used to start with the Arab-Israeli conflict. 
uh, uh, until now, when I will end with it, <laughs> maybe, uh, and say a word about it, uh, because it is still a very important element uh, in the region. And whereas people will tell you that uh, 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 demonstrators in the street did not invoke the Arab-Israeli conflict, and uh, deduct from that that therefore you know it is no longer a priority on people's minds. I beg to differ, and differ very strongly. Uh, the fact that it was not brought up during demonstrations uh, uh, was not uh, uh, was not done because it was not the proper context. It does not mean that people don't have still very strong views on it. We've all seen what happened in Cairo with the storming of the Israeli embassy a few months ago, for example. And uh, 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 I think uh, in, the, in, the, uh, pro in the current context uh, of uh, the Arab uprisings, it will be difficult on one hand for the United States, which is uh, trying to uh, uh, implement a new policy in the region that favors stability through reform rather than stability at the expense of reform, such as in the past, and that attempts to find a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's going to be very difficult for the U.S. if it wants to regain uh, sort of credibility among uh, the Arab peoples of the region. It will be difficult for it to argue uh, uh, to the Arab world that if you are Egyptians or Libyans or Syrians uh, or Yemenis or Tunisians yearning for freedom, we are with you. But if you are Palestinians yearning for freedom, it's complicated. That's not an argument that will sit well in the region. And I believe that the window for a two-state solution is already closing even before the Arab uprisings started. I say this because facts on the ground will tell you that settlement building has reached a stage where the number of settlers in the West Bank and Gaza is over 500,000 today. And even if you come up with a solution that would take 400,000 of them, annex them to Israel because they are on the green line, you still have to deal with what is close today to 100,000 settlers dispersed throughout the West Bank in a way that, that makes it very, very difficult to separate the two communities. Uh, and that is uh, not saying anything about Jerusalem, which is today uh, uh, completely isolated uh, from the uh, rest of the West Bank. You also have the demographic element, where today the number of Jews today inside Israel is exactly equal to the number of Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, uh, in areas under Israel's control. That is, in Israel proper, the West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, and I'm quoting official Israeli statistics, not uh, Arab or Palestinian statistics, which means that if there is no two-state solution and soon, uh, uh, we are going to face uh, a situation where uh, we will have to admit that there is no solution in the short term and in the medium to long term if Palestinians will not be able to have their own state they will argue for equal rights in the state within which they are living which of course will mean the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state and therefore uh, uh, we're facing an ironic situation where basically a two-state solution is no longer just in the interests of Palestinians but it's actually crucial to the survival of the state of Israel if it wants to be both Jewish and democratic. And if not, uh, I'm afraid that we're going to uh, uh, have to admit, and this coming from someone who has really uh, devoted almost all his life trying to find peace between the two parties, we will have to admit that the window uh, might, uh, might be closing if not closed already. You add to that the Arab uprisings, and you're going to have a situation where emerging governments in the Middle East are not going to be uh, sort of soft on Israel if, for example, we have another incursion into the West Bank or into Lebanon uh, or uh, with continued settlement activity. And Israel's concern 
of a of a hostile neighborhood will become a self-fulfilling prophecy if it continues with the occupation. I say this, of course, uh, in an idealistic way, suggesting that because of all these logical, if you want, arguments, that both parties need to move soon towards an agreement, but the world of politics is uh, almost never logical. And uh, 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 therefore, I'm not hopeful uh, in an election year in the U.S., in the presence of an Israeli government which is, in my view, not interested in a serious solution, in a viable two-state solution. I'm not hopeful that we're going to arrive at a solution soon. And therefore, you know, I'm beginning to think that we might be facing uh, the uh, uh, issue or the challenge of having no solution at all. Uh, one last word. I might have painted a, a, a rather pessimistic uh, view of uh, what is going on in the region, both in terms of the peace process, but also in terms of the uprisings. I'm actually not pessimistic at all. I think that uh, the region holds a lot of promise in the future, uh, and I think that the uh, Arab uprisings have at least broken the, 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 the barrier of fear uh, uh, that has been there with Arab publics for a long time. There's a sense of empowerment that the average Arab citizen feels today that they can change their state of affairs and equally importantly that they can do so peacefully. This is an, an, a new sort of paradigm in the region uh, uh, in a region where the youth is playing an increasingly important role. Seventy percent of the Arab world is under 30 years of age. This is a very, very youthful region. It's a region no longer uh, 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 willing to accept what their parents did, acquiesced in. Uh, one of the best uh, comments I heard about the uprisings in Egypt uh, was by a colleague who said uh, uh, the youth in Egypt are not revolting against their parents. They are revolting on behalf of their parents. And I think that's very true. The problem, of course, is that they are not organized. Uh, and therefore, so far, we have seen a situation where the benefits so far of the uprisings have not been reaped by sort of the elements that started the revolution, but rather by the organized forces, uh, the Islamists uh, in particular. But I don't expect that situation to, uh, pers uh, uh, to remain. And I think that the only way to level the playing field is by bringing everybody inside the process, Islamists included, and ask them to deliver on their promises uh, for a better Arab world. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yeah, would you comment on uh, the role of Sunni versus Shia influence in the Middle East? Uh, I think, um, well, uh, uh, for those who, uh, uh, you know, don't know much about this, seven, close to 80 percent of the Muslim uh, Arab world uh, is Sunni uh, or Orthodox Islam, belongs to Sunni Islam. And about 20% belong to Shiite Islam, which has some theological differences I don't want to go into. Most of the Shiites in the Arab world are in uh, places like Iraq, Lebanon. Iraq, they're probably 60% of the population. In Lebanon, they're probably about 30%. And then about 10% in Saudi Arabia, about 70% in Bahrain, uh, and, uh, and that's about it. The rest of the Arab world uh, uh, does not have uh, many uh, Shiite numbers to uh, talk about. I think the Arab world has done a huge uh, mistake and, and uh, disfavor to itself by uh, 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 by discriminating against Shiites for a very long time, for a thousand years. Uh, 
accusing them of not being loyal citizens. Uh, and in, in modern times, because of Iran, the easy accusation was for uh, uh, governments to uh, state that Shiites were all uh, you know, loyal to Iran rather than to Arab states. I don't believe that is true. And I believe that uh, you know, if you're not able to treat your citizens as first-class citizens, then you know, you're just inviting them to seek maybe, uh, or at least some of them, to seek protection uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, so when I uh, talk about the fight for pluralism, I also mean that, that the Arab world today is a mosaic of ethnic, religious groups. You know, we have Christians, we have Jews, we have Shiites, we have Armenians, we have Chechnyans, we have Berbers in North Africa, we have Kurds. It's, it's a true mosaic of different uh, communities, but so far we have not been uh, respecting diversity uh, in all of its aspects. Uh, uh, and and uh, the fight in the future must ensure that all citizens, Shiite or Sunni, uh, or Christian or, or what, whatever, must be treated as equal citizens. We cannot keep talking about different layers of citizenship if the Arab world is to move uh, uh, properly in the future. And that, you know, honestly re relies on, on the youth. I think one of the, one of the positive signs that I've seen uh, in a trip I made to Jordan this last summer was that the youth was finally starting to break away from the traditional fault lines that their parents had. And were n I, I'm not saying all of them, but at least some of them were ready not to define themselves as, let's say, East Jordanian versus Palestinian or Christians versus Muslims. Uh, or northerners versus southerners, but rather as Jordanians. And uh, if, uh, you know, if this continues and if the youth is, are able to organize themselves, I think that can only bode well uh, for the future. Ambassador Moasher, I would like to thank you on behalf of President's Leadership Class for coming to speak tonight and again here. Uh, we really enjoyed everything that you had to say. And I was wondering what we can do as current leaders here at Purdue and potential future diplomats um, and you know, the global, um, global leaders, uh, what we can do now to prepare ourselves to meet these global challenges um, in the future but still work towards that right now. I, uh I spoke to a, a freshman uh, global leadership class just before I came here, and, uh, including to you. And I recounted the, the time that I first came to Purdue as a 20-year-old uh, senior uh, in college, uh, having uh, fled the civil war in Lebanon and, and uh, coming to finish my degree here. And I uh, remember that my uh, idea about Purdue in the pre-internet age uh, was uh, a city uh, that looked like Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and you can imagine my shock. <laughs> when I discovered it wasn't. Uh, uh, nonetheless, I had six of the best years of my life at Purdue. I... Uh, 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 came, uh, you know, uh, face to face with uh, a community that was extremely friendly, even though one that might not have seen the world, uh, where I was not treated as a foreigner, despite the fact that for them I probably came from Mars. And uh, uh, I, I really appreciated that. And it has uh, sort of uh, affected my whole thinking, uh, not just about Americans, but about the need uh, uh, not to have stereotypes and to reach out to all kinds of uh, other cultures. So I say this because I'm very, very excited about the fact that, uh, you know, today there is a global policy institute at Purdue. There is a, a, a conscious decision uh, to have uh, the strengths that Purdue University have be shared with the outside world, uh, even with all the challenges that, let's say, a university in the heartland of America has uh, in being able to successfully uh, uh, make a footprint 
when it is away from media centers, away from decision-making centers, etc. The fact that you have a class called global leadership and that freshmen, you know, are, are able to take that class, you know, I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 30 years old, not 18, I think, I think is a plus. So I would encourage uh, you as a student, but Purdue as a university, to reach out more. And I think uh, Purdue has many, many strengths uh, in engineering, in agriculture, uh, 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 in other disciplines as well. You have now an international uh, student body that we didn't have when I was at Purdue, uh, people from China, India, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, that can really bode well for uh, 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 a more uh, globally oriented relationship that Purdue can have than before. Uh, you mentioned before the lack of organization of the protest movement. Um, a very well organized part of almost Every society is a military. Uh, how likely is the chance that we're going to see a mix of theocratic and military governments in the Middle East? I, I honestly don't see any chance for a theocratic government. I think you will see uh, many countries where religion will play an important role, uh, but that is different from a theocracy like Iran where uh, uh, religion, you know, uh, not just religion, but where a religious system uh, is one that, uh, the, that governs. I don't uh, expect that to happen. The Muslim Brotherhood itself has made that itself clear that they don't intend to have that. And if they do, I don't think the popula populace would accept that. Uh, 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 a few weeks ago, uh, uh, people in Egypt felt that the uh, Muslim Brotherhood was being too soft on the military, and they could uh, put a demonstration of a, one, of a million people in the street uh, where none of the Islamists took part. So I think we are coming to sort of a realization in the Middle East that uh, people are not ready to replace one uh, autocratic system with another, even if the first was secular and the second autocratic. In terms of the role of the military, it's also, uh, it also depends uh, uh, on the countries uh, at hand. In Tunisia, for example, the military proved that it can be totally neutral. And that is the best way uh, 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 to happen. In Algeria, of course, the military uh, was not neutral in the past uh, and is still ruling the country with an iron hand. Uh, in Egypt, uh, it's a mix. The military will probably try to negotiate a role for itself uh, uh, that, uh, that would be less than totally democratic and accountable, but not also one where they will exercise full power as they used to before. It is still a system in flux, but I think that once you have a new government in, in Egypt and a new president, the, the, the ability of the military to maintain the same kind of power that they have today uh, will not be the same. Remember, the military in Egypt was accepted at the start of the revolution as a security blanket, as the only guarantor for stability, and therefore people were willing to look the other way about the excesses of the military. No one believed the military in Egypt was you know, democratic uh, by any chance, but they were willing to look the other way so that the revolution can succeed. Today, the popularity of the military in Egypt has gone down, way down, uh, because once, uh, you know, once <coughs> elections took place and a system of governing is being put together, people will not accept uh, the same role uh, that they had. You have many uh, models uh, uh, to look at. I don't think any model can be just transported as it is uh, about the role of the military. You have a Turkish model where the role of the military evolved through decades and uh, 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 under totally different conditions. You have a model in Indonesia where uh, also the military was able to relinquish power but through uh, an agreement uh, with the civilian uh, uh, leadership there. I cannot, tell, uh, I cannot tell what will happen. 
I am, I am uh, confident, as I said, that the military uh, will not play the same role in Egypt. In other places in the Arab world, uh, the military uh, uh, is very strong. Uh, but uh, take a place like Syria, okay, where the military has ruled the country through an iron hand for the last 40 years. It's been 11 months, 11 months of uprising in Syria. Uh, uh, at least 6,000 people have died and no one has any intention of going back home. So the military is not everything. I mean, uh, uh, we've reached a stage in the Arab world, I think, where the demand for better governance, in my view, is irreversible. Um, yes, you mentioned um that because the secular systems that were there before um, were not committed to democracy, maybe political Islam should have a chance to prove itself. Except if you look around the world, you know, every functioning democracy that lasted was built on fundamental secular principles. You take the United States, for example, you know, built on freedom of religion, you know, it guarantees due process rights and it guarantees the separation of church and state. And if you look around the Middle East, perhaps one can argue that the only functioning democracy is Israel, where all these things are also enshrined in their constitution. So how can you reconcile that with political Islam and you know, whether it can be fully committed to democracy and pluralism? Uh, on the first uh, question, uh, look, I'm a secular person. I'm also a Christian Arab. Uh, but to argue that uh, the only system that will work is a totally secular system in the region, I think is to misread what the region is about. There is no way in my view that you can have a totally secular system where you have total separation of church and state, or mosque and state in this uh, case, uh, as exists in the West. Uh, there is an overwhelming majority of people that want religion to play a part not to play a part that is against democracy, because there is also an overwhelming majority of people, and I'm, I'm quoting polls, I'm not just giving you subjective arguments, an overwhelming majority of people, over 85%, that think democracy is the best system in the Arab world. Uh, so uh, 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 a wish for religion to play a part should not be misread into a stand against democracy in the Middle East. But to argue, as I said, for a total separation is, for, is, not, is not feasible, uh, at least with the, exist, uh, with the conditions, nor, nor in my own opinion needed. Uh, I think you can have uh, a fully uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, view, even with people, uh, uh, people's uh, views about religion. Take Turkey as an example. Okay, I mean, the majority of Turks are very conservative Muslims, and yet they are also equally committed to a pluralistic democratic system of governance. I would caution against the argument that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. I would really caution, one, because it's not true. Uh, uh, internally, internally, Israel is a democracy for Jews. If you're, if you're Jewish, it's a democracy. If you're not Jewish, it's not a democracy at all. I mean, ask any Arab Israeli who lives inside Israel, and they would tell you that they are at best second-class citizens. But I would caution against that, because you're facing a situation today where emerging democracies in the Middle East will reach a point where they will come democracies, and Israel will become the outlier as the only occupier of another people in the whole world. So this is uh, sort of, to me, an outdated argument that Israel needs to update if it wants to be part of the neighborhood and if it wants to live in peace and security with everybody else. It cannot keep selling itself as the only democracy in the Arab world because that notion is very, very rapidly disappearing. Hello, Ambassador. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, you did a great job earlier of painting a picture of what a political system in one of these countries looks like. And I was wondering if you could do the same thing and kind of talk about what the economies look like. Uh, specifically, I'm interested in uh, what the banking sectors look like. And in, sorry, in what? The banking sectors mm -hmm. in these kind of countries. And um, what investments or if there's any concept of venture capital. The problem with economic reform as it was uh, implemented in the Arab world in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years, is that uh, 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 it developed a very bad name in the Arab world. And it developed a bad name because it was economic liberalization, that is privatization of state assets, opening up the trade system, joining the WTO, integrating with the global economy, which all are, were needed in the Arab world, but were still done in an environment with no political reform process. And so in the absence of a system of checks and balances, the benefits from this uh, opening up process economically went basically to the cronies of the regime or regimes. And you've seen that in Egypt, you've seen that in Tunisia, you've seen that in many parts of the Arab world where people uh, uh, started to say, well, look at this. We, our lives have not got any better. Corruption has increased. And the cronies of the regime are the beneficiaries. We don't want economic reform. Don't talk to us about economic reform. We want the state to come back and guarantee jobs for us and give us decent salaries and, and uh, have a more equitable distribution of resources, etc. So the, the challenge today is that a lot of people today are asking the state to do things it can not sustain and will not lead, of course, to more productive economies. And yet the state, in its attempt to appease the street, because it's afraid that if it doesn't, it might be toppled, the state is finding itself, uh, in the short term at least, uh, succumbing, if you want, to populist demands, rather than putting in place uh, economic systems that make sense. Egypt today uh, signed uh, uh, a loan agreement with the IMF for $3.2 billion that it rejected a year ago. Uh, so in the end, people will, you know, will go back to, to responsible policies, if you want. But this time, this time, governments will have to convince people uh, that uh, it is serious about the political reform process. That while it's doing economic reform, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it will lead to better uh, 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 levels of development and, and, and growth, uh, 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 it will have to convince people of that. And it's going to take an awful lot of <laughs> convincing to do uh, because of uh, past experiences. I don't think we're going to go back in the Arab world to, let's say, socialist systems such as existed under uh, the Nasserists or the Ba'athists, but we're also not going to uh, have sort of totally market-driven uh, economies. In fact, uh, I would argue the whole world has, after the global financial crisis, is moving away anyway from totally uh, market-driven economies and to a, to a state where uh, there is a role for the state as a regulator uh, uh, rather than as a participant in the economic activity of the country. Thank you. Um, going back a little bit to the um, Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, this may sound maybe a little bit eccentric, but uh, the, it seems uh, you mentioned how many settlements are in the West Bank, and dismantling them is um, maybe from an Israeli standpoint very impractical. Has it ever been brought up, uh, the idea of leasing the land from the Palestinians for a definite time, just like the situation between China and Hong Kong, where those settlers would be allowed to stay in exchange for a certain monetary rent that would go to the Palestinian people. And, um, you know, let's say after 50 years, um, you know, they would sit down again and discuss uh, the issue of lease or the territories would go back to its, um, you know, original people. Um, that might sound, uh, in my opinion, maybe... Uh, politically feasible for both parties where um, 
the Palestinians can get to rule their, themselves and also they have an expectation for the land to be returned in a certain period of time, but for an exchange, a monetary exchange like a lease. Thank you. There have been actually a number of proposals. This is one of them that have been suggested. The other one was to talk about a binational state, a state, for example, in Palestine that has two nationalities, Israelis and uh, Palestinians, where Israelis are residents of the state but not citizens. Uh, uh, in the same way, you might have also a binational state in Israel where Arabs will also be able to uh, be there, Palestinians, as residents, uh, but not citizens. Uh, frankly, all these ideas uh, uh, suffer, I think, from one major element, which is how do you guarantee the security of people? I mean, uh, to, to, protect, to protect Israeli uh, settlers in the West Bank uh, uh, who, are, you know, who are there, frankly, illegally under international law, uh, uh, is going to be a monumental task. I don't think it's possible uh, to be able to do that. And in 50 years, as you suggest, you'll be facing a situation where uh, the population would have mushroomed to a point in a very, as you probably know, very small uh, territory, uh, would have mushroomed to the point where it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, impossible. I... Um, I still think the best option is a two-state solution, but I also think uh, it's probably too late. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, um, where do you think Syria is going? Um, do you think it's going to follow the same Iraqi model? Uh, civil war, separation of the country? What are your expectations? I think the Syrian regime is over. I mean, that's uh, that uh, view I share with, uh, with most analysts. I don't think a regime that uh, kills 6,000 people uh, of its own can claim any legitimacy, and it doesn't. Uh, if you look at the polls in the uh, uh, region today, Bashar al-Assad went from being one of the most popular leaders in the Arab world three years ago uh, to uh, a leader that enjoys almost no popularity in the region. Certain parts of Syrian, the Syrian community are still with him. Uh, the Christians, for example, are worried that they might face the same uh, ish, uh, uh, fate that uh, uh, the Christians in Iraq did. Uh, uh, elements from the merchant class are also worried. Uh, and and therefore, uh, uh, you know, have not totally given up on him. But uh, as I said, it's uh, it's very very difficult to go back to the status quo ante. Uh, the region has given up on Bashar al-Assad. Uh, countries that have supported him for a very long time, like uh, Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, are uh, now one of the most uh, 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 vocal supporter uh, opponents of the regime. Having said that, this is a regime, a minority regime, that is not interested in any reform process because any reform process, however mild, is going to mean the ouster of the regime itself. And uh, as such, it looks at this as a zero-sum game. Uh, uh, it is not interested, in my view, in a reform process. But, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it is willing to be as brutal as it takes uh, to cling to power. And therefore, what we're seeing today in Syria is people being bombed by planes, by uh, rockets, by tanks, uh, in a very, uh, very brutal manner. Uh, there is no magic uh, wand, uh, unfortunately, in Syria. Uh, the international community is not going, at least uh, in the in the at least in the foreseeable, uh, I think, uh, future, is not going to intervene militarily. Uh, large elements of the opposition, anyway, does not want the in international community to intervene militarily. Uh, after uh, what happened in Libya, I mean, even in this country, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, a lot of opposition to any new 
sort of military intervention in the region after Iraq, after Afghanistan, after Libya. Uh, uh, Arab states are not willing to send any uh, military troops because they don't want to be seen as killing fellow Arabs. The Turks uh, have a limited uh, uh, sort of window uh, of maneuver uh, without the cover of, of Arab states. So I say all this to say that this is going to take some time. Uh, I still don't expect it to take more than a year because I just don't think that with 70, 80 people a day now being killed uh, that things can go on like this without something giving, whether it is uh, a general inside the army deciding enough is enough, whether it is the international community uh, 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 deciding on a different course of action, I don't know at this stage, but I, uh, I simply cannot believe that we are going to uh, look at the situation indefinitely. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for giving us the knowledge base that will enable us to interpret the news over the coming months <laughs> in what has to be one of the most fascinating and, and dynamic regions of the world today. I would like to uh, present to you a small token of our appreciation from the Global Policy Research Institute and for Purdue University. Thank, Thank, you, so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.